What are social responses? This is a term, uh, it's a little bit like the term social investment, I suppose. A social investment is a social response to a human uh, need or um, adversity. So this refers to, uh, in the cases of violence, how do your friends and family and uh, your neighbors, how do they respond? What do they say? What do they do? And many people will tell you that the social response from people you turn to for help is sometimes more egregious, more painful, more harmful uh, than even the original assault. It turns out that when she was 14 years old, she ran away from home. She was on the street. She wasn't eating. She was extremely thin, emaciated. She was picked up by police and taken to a hospital. So I asked her, um, what, what did you talk about? She said, well, I learned that I had anorexia and clinical depression. That began her 30-year career as a psychiatric patient. So I then asked, uh, uh, what were you doing on the street? She said, well, it wasn't safe to be home. Why wasn't it safe to be home? Because my brother, my brother was hurting me. And uh, so what kinds of things? Well, he was molesting me. I see. So you ran away from home, if I understand, to avoid being near your brother. Yes, that's right. That's how you were resisting the violence. Yes, that's right. Um, who's the first person you told about this? Um, I don't remember. Maybe I was 24 or 25, she said. I said, okay. When they picked you up and put you in the hospital when you were 14, did you tell the psychiatrist? No, they didn't ask. And besides, they never interviewed me separately from having my mother in the room. Why was that a problem? Why wouldn't you want your mother to know? Because my mother would never believe me. How do you know your mother would never believe you? And then she remembered something that she had, I think, protected herself from remembering for a long period of time. She remembered that when she was eight years old, she did tell her mother what her brother did. Uh, her mother responded, she was in the bathtub at the time actually, talking with her mother the very day that her brother first molested her. She said, my brother, Tommy, let's say, made me touch his private parts. And her mother responded by taking her by the back of the head, pushing her head underwater, holding it there, then pulling her head up and saying, your brother would never do that again, never do that to you. So do you think that she told people again? And that the research about social responses is very, very clear. When people get a negative response when they first disclose, they become highly unlikely ever to disclose again. It turns out it's not just the violence that people are facing. Often they're facing negative social responses that are at least as painful and harmful. For Muriel, that was a, a terrible burden to bear for so many years. Victims who receive positive social responses are likely to recover much more quickly, in a much more stable way, much more likely to cooperate with authorities, much more likely to follow through on court proceedings. So if you want to understand how victims respond and resist, and how offenders use violence, you must take into account social responses. If you're a woman and your husband beats you up and then he climbs on your body and he says he wants to have sex on you, as one woman said to me, the difference between whether or not you smack him in the face, knee him in the groin and scream and run out of the apartment, or whether or not you go limp and get it over with as quickly as possible. The difference is whether or not you think if you run out of the apartment and scream, will your neighbor help you? Will anyone listen to you? Will they believe you? And if you think they won't, then maybe you won't do that. Maybe you'll have to go limp and get it over with as quickly as possible. In other words, how victims respond to offenders is tied to the social responses we create. So our central job becomes to provide effective, just, dignified social responses. It turns out that although all victims resist violence in one way, shape, or form, seldom is that recognized, particularly in traditional clinical psychotherapy, psychiatric literature. Uh, the reality of victims' resistance is recognized in dissident literature, in history, in anthropology, in autobiography, in poetry, in music, in memoir. It only seems to be missing from the discourse of the helping professions, which is kind of a strange thing. There are reasons for that, and some of the reasons have to do with language. But, Telling a professional that the language they use is wrong is a bit like telling a grandparent their new grandbaby is ugly. <laughs> you want to be careful. 
Unlike babies, some descriptions are quite ugly. So, as what some Canadian genius said, you know, if you hit someone on the head with a frying pan, it's not cooking. <laughs> Car theft is not auto sharing. Bank robbery is not a financial transaction. If you attack someone on their genitals or with yours, it's not sex. It's a categorically different kind of action. It's a violent action. So, why do we get this confusion? It's because we confuse unilateral actions, which are actions by one person against another, with mutual actions, which are actions that two people do together. Here's an example from the Northwest Territories where we did some research. It's an Aboriginal woman who's called in to try to get an emergency pr protection order. She said, the court says, now she's reporting uh, a sexual assault. The court says, okay, and right from the start, he's been aggressive and sexually abusive. The applicant, the woman, says, no, he was okay until August. Then one night we started to kiss. Then I didn't want to, and then he didn't listen. And then she starts to detail an assault. The court says, okay, was that reported to police? No. Now, was that, was that the first time you two had relations, had sex? She says, that was the first time I've ever had sex. So what you have here is a powerful, educated magistrate turning a rape into a sexual experience. I believe that violates the fundamental rights of the woman to equal benefit and protection of the law and wherever it occurs, should be actively confronted and stopped. So, child prostitution, or sorry, child sex tourism. What happens is um, some adults get on a plane and they fly to Thailand, and defenseless children are dragged into a hotel room. They don't run away because they've been told their parents will be murdered if they do. And the adults demean terrorize, humiliate, and debase them in every way imaginable. And we call that child sex tourism. Nothing to do with sex, nothing to do with tourism. That's international child rape. Taximika.